The deposed Shah of Iran is dead. Iran's new leaders say they're glad, but they still won't release the embassy hostages. The Shah died this morning at the military hospital in Cairo where he'd been treated for cancer. President Sadat, an old friend of the Shah's, announced the death on Egyptian television. He scheduled a state funeral for Tuesday. A tomb in the Egyptian royal mausoleum has already been prepared. In Tehran, a special free news sheet was published and radio programmes were interrupted with the words The bloodsucker of the century has died at last. But on the hostages, a spokesman said nothing was changed. The Shah had ruled Iran for nearly four decades before the revolution drove him out in January of last year. Philip Hayton looks back. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. For nearly 40 years, the Shah of Iran, the self-styled King of Kings. From the peacock throne, he governed Iran as if he owned it. This march past was part of a 40 million pound jamboree to celebrate 2,000 years of the Iranian monarchy. The Shah also treated his guests to quail eggs stuffed with caviar. With his glamorous empress, Farah Diba, he ruled with an ease and style that goes with power and wealth. For years, he seemed the West's most invincible ally. The Shah's enormous reserves of oil helped endear him to the West. He promised his 35 million subjects he'd use oil to provide them with wealth and security beyond their dreams. His goal was to make Iran the world's fifth industrial power. The Shah called it a white revolution because everything would be achieved without bloodshed. He lavished vast sums on the armed forces to protect his kingdom, but he was badly prepared to meet the enemy at home. Many Iranians branded their Shah a ruthless and corrupt dictator. To quell the trouble, the Shah's regime murdered and tortured. But that only seemed to strengthen the hand of Ayatollah Khomeini, the revolution's inspiration. With the Shah away on what he called a holiday, the way was clear for Ayatollah Khomeini to return from Paris as Iran's spiritual and political leader. Amid the euphoria, there were hopes of a new Iran, more religious, yet with more freedom. Instead, Iran slid towards anarchy. The power struggle revealed a vicious and vindictive streak among some of the new leaders. It came as no surprise to the Shah and his family, who'd become international fugitives, flitting from one country to another, trying to find a home. The constant moves did not help the Shah's deteriorating health. Eventually, he ended up in a Cairo hospital, a guest of President Sadat. His, move, his mood veered from anger to sorrow. In a way, though, he was prepared for death. to my country because this is the most beautiful thing that could happen. What could I take away with me when I go in the grave? Not even uh, a dress, maybe just a piece of white cloth, that's all. So I'm philosophical enough to know these things. And I have enough for the earthly needs. So what I've got to take with me in the grave is history. With the Shah's death, the overriding hope for the Americans must be for a solution to the plight of their hostages. But as our Middle East correspondent Keith Graves explains, that solution is as far away as ever. The death of the deposed Shah is unlikely to make any difference to the position of the hostages. The Iranians have made it plain that their future will be decided by the country's new parliament when it meets. Within Iran, the hostages have ceased to be a burning issue. Inflation, unemployment, food shortages and increasing political chaos are all more important day-to-day -day topics for Iranians to bother themselves with. And the hostages have become pawns in the wrangling between the politicians, led by President Banisada, and the fanatical mullahs, led by Khomeini. It's nearly nine months since a group of so-called students took over the United States Embassy in Tehran. A nest of spies, they called it. They took prisoner more than 50 diplomats, demanding the return of the Shah as the price of their release. After the unsuccessful bid to rescue them in April, they were dispersed around the country with the demand of some militants for a show trial still hanging over their heads. There's also a demand, and one that has much popular support, for the return of the Shah's personal fortune, estimated at a staggering $30 billion held in foreign banks. And that demand has been renewed today, as Alex Brody reports from Tehran.
Qatar's death will have no effect on relations between Iran and the United States, said a presidential spokesman. And it seems clear that any hopes that it could be the key to the hostages' release are premature. The demand for the return of the Shah is obviously defunct, but there is no intention of going back on the demand for his wealth. Mr. Ali Reza Nobari, head of the central bank, said Iran was pursuing its claim for the return of $32 billion, which he said the Shah had stolen, and much of this was in American banks. Official reaction from the leadership was cautious. No one burst forth with remarks. It was largely limited to spokesmen who expressed pleasure for themselves and on behalf of their political bosses. The students holding the American hostages contented themselves with a firm no comment. The Shah will be given a state funeral by the Egyptians, but the only person of any significance attending will be President Sadat himself. Most countries are anxious to keep their distance, even in death, from the camel driver's son who became, amongst other things, King of Kings, a far cry from his days of glory not so long ago. The United States government's reaction to the death was terse, sympathy for his family, but no word of praise or mention of his long-time alliance with Washington. No such restraint, though, from presidential candidate Ronald Reagan, who was fulsome in his praise, describing the Shah as a loyal and valued friend of the United States. Almost every other government in the world made no comment or merely recorded the death as a stark fact. Britain was one exception. An official Downing Street statement said the government had learned with sorrow of the death. His friendship for this country will not be forgotten, it said. It was a statement that caused some surprise, particularly as coming in the midst of so much apathy at the event, it's sure to be widely repeated throughout a world mostly anxious to dissociate itself from the Shah and his regime. Now, other news. In Antwerp in Belgium, two hand grenades exploded into a bus queue of Jewish children who were waiting to go on holiday. The children were outside a Jewish cultural centre. One French boy of 16 was killed, and 20 other children, mostly Belgian, were injured, one critically. The attack happened while they were waiting for a bus to take them to a summer camp. Later, police arrested a man who is thought to be a Lebanese. He told them he acted alone, but police are still looking for other suspects. An eight-year-old girl has had her right arm sewn back on after it was severed in a road accident last night. Surgeons at a Manchester hospital used microsurgery to carry out the operation on Emma Taylor of Bolton, Lancashire. Martin Henfield reports. The operation carried out on the girl, Emma Taylor, lasted more than seven hours, and surgeons worked till two in the morning to sew back the arm. Microsurgery owes much to advances in the manufacture of tiny needles, finer than a human hair, which enable surgeons to repair blood vessels only half a millimetre in diameter. Given the right conditions, surgeons say an arm could be separated from the body for up to six hours and still be retransplanted. Retransplants here at Withington Hospital have been going on for more than two years. Fingers and hands have been put back, but this is the first time an arm has been retransplanted. I asked one of the surgeons in charge of the operation what were the chances of success. Uh, although problems can set in in the next few days, I think almost certainly the, the limb will uh, stay viable. The problem, of course, is the future growth of the limb and the return of movement and sensation. These will not be normal because there was damage to the growth center of the arm and because the muscles and the nerves were very severely damaged by the type of the injury. Emma also received serious head injuries in the crash and the hospital described her condition as very poorly. The Prime Minister of the Irish Republic, Mr Charles Hockey, has spoken out against Irish-American organisations supporting the IRA. Speaking in Cork, he said his government rejected all violence. There is clear and conclusive evidence available to the government here from security and other sources that NORAID has provided support for the campaign of violence and indeed direct assistance in its pursuit. On the basis of these activities, it stands condemned and I appeal to all in America who have the interests of Ireland at heart not to give this body any support, financial or moral. Our Dublin correspondent says Mr Hockey's clear statement has answered critics who have accused him of sitting on the fence over IRA support groups in America. Before his speech, there had been an attempt to undermine his leadership because of his attitude. 
In Northern Ireland, a soldier was killed and another seriously injured in an explosion near the border with the Republic. They were on foot patrol on the road from Ochnacloy to Monaghan. The dead man has been named as Corporal Robert Thompson, aged 26, who was serving with the Royal Highland Fusiliers. A report by Patrick Burns. The bomb in a car beside the border checkpoint killed Corporal Thompson instantly and flung wreckage up to 100 yards away. It followed a warning to Monaghan Telephone Exchange in the Republic that there was a bomb on a bridge at the border. When the RUC and the army arrived, it's believed terrorists watching from hills in the Republic overlooking the checkpoint triggered the bomb by remote control. Corporal Thompson and the colleague who was injured were less than 15 feet from the car when it blew up. The use of radio control by terrorists detonating bombs in Northern Ireland from vantage points across the border in the Irish Republic was the means by which the IRA inflicted the biggest ever attack on the security forces here last August at Warren Point, where 18 soldiers died. This latest attack is bound to add still more heat to the already contentious issue of cross-border security. Unionist politicians in Northern Ireland have long argued that the Irish Republic is failing to stop terrorists using the South as a safe haven from which to launch attacks in the North. Mr Tony Benn has warned the Labour Party to beware of what he forecasts will be increasingly sharp attacks by the media in the coming months. Speaking to young socialists in Gloucestershire, Mr Benn singled out BBC News bulletins. He said they were being used, consciously or unconsciously, to discredit Labour's National Executive Committee, the Young Socialists, and all who were working for full employment, disarmament and peace. The Olympics have passed the halfway stage with more success for Britain. In the rowing events, bronze medals went to the Coxless Pair and Coxless Four crews, but the biggest surprise came in the eights. The British team, which came together only three months ago, beat off strong Eastern Bloc competition to take the silver. A sad day, though, for Brendan Foster. He finished 11th in the 10,000 metres in what was almost certainly the last big race of his career. Because of the boycott, attendance at the Games has been well down on the expected numbers. The consequence, for one man at least, has been disastrous, as Christopher Morris now reports from Moscow. Hundreds of thousands of Olympic tickets like these remain unsold, while from an office in this Moscow hotel, representatives of Western travel agents are desperately trying to get rid of tickets worth over a million pounds. Ironically, in their search for Olympic seats, Muscovites are unable to buy the unwanted tickets because the travel agents refuse to sell them for Russian rubles they're not allowed to take out of the country. Well, this is literally a drop in the ocean. I mean, these are some of the event tickets from today's date onward. And you must bear in mind that we're halfway through the Games. So we've had thousands and thousands of pounds wasted up till today's date, and it looks like these are dead currency now. So how do you sum up the, uh, the whole exercise of bringing British holidaymakers out to see the Olympic Games? Well, for those who wanted to come, we're delighted they're here. From a business point of view, an utter sham, a complete disaster. The ticket scandal means whole blocks of empty seats at the Olympic Stadium. The Russians had expected half a million tourists for the Games, but the boycott has effectively wrecked those hopes. However, the 2,000 or so Britons who've made the journey to Moscow have now been able to use their English money to buy some of the best seats at the Games. About 4,000 motorcyclists rode into central London today to protest against the compulsory wearing of crash helmets. They swept through the streets, waving their helmets in defiance of the law introduced seven years ago. Since then, they've kept up a constant campaign against the legislation, which they say is an attack on their freedom. The police could only watch helplessly. After a mass demonstration in Hyde Park, the motorcyclists prepared to return home. But without the safety of numbers, the ride back was made with the protection of a helmet and the law. And that's all for me. Let's have a look at the weather.